our thanks to the band. We could also say thank you to the technical people who worked so hard. Unfortunately, the live stream was down for the first part of the service, and we apologize uh, to those who are tuning in at home that they have missed part of the service. The gremlins are at work, and uh, it was due to circumstances beyond our control. So our apologies. I think we're up and running now, so hopefully uh, you will enjoy the rest of the service. We're going to read together from Mark's Gospel, the fourth chapter. We're reading from verse 35 through to verse 41. Mark chapter 4, reading verse 35 to 41. Let's attend together to the word of God. That day when evening came, he said to the disciples, let us go over to the other side. That is Jesus said. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Amen. And God bless to our hearts and to our minds the reading of his own word. About a hundred years ago or so, an English clergyman named Whiting was sailing in the Mediterranean when a storm broke out with unusual fury. There were hurricane winds. The waves were like mountains, and they came crushing against the ship, and all on board felt doomed. The lifeboats were useless. The storm was so fierce. Whiting continued in fervent prayer throughout the storm, and by the special providence of God, the storm lost its power, and they made it to port. Out of this incident, Whiting wrote to him, Eternal Father, strong to save, with the prayer for those in peril on the sea. The wind and the sea are mighty forces, and they take many lives. Remember when I was 12, 13, uh, arriving at the BB one night, and our BB captain uh, worked for timber importing, and he had just been down at the docks signing off on some timber that had arrived. And I remember him coming into the hall and saying, the sea does such tremendous damage. The ship uh, on which this timber was imported had been in the midst of a storm. The Sea of Galilee can be treacherous too, even though it's an inland lake. Because of the geographical uh, situation in which it lies with the low cliffs and the valley going into, the low valleys going down between the cliffs, it draws down cold air, which produces a storm in a matter of minutes. One minute it can be as calm as any, and then the next minute these waves uh, build up. One minute it can be as smooth as glass. Ten minutes later it can be a raging storm. We want to look at the experience of the disciples as they were caught in one of these sudden storms. In obedience to Jesus, they had found themselves in trouble. They were probably taken by surprise, thinking that Jesus is with us, so we cannot run into danger. It was his command that they had got set out on the sea. But there's no, it is true to say that there is no such a thing as absence of danger when we obey Jesus. There are many who not only risk their lives, but lose their lives in obedience to Jesus Christ. The storms of life face all of us. So I want us to look at 
several lessons from this passage today. First of all, there is the lesson of the sudden storm. The storm came suddenly, completely unexpectedly and violently. It swept down on the helpless disciples and threatened to overwhelm them. Even the expert fishermen among them who made their living on this lake, they were frightened. They had taken this journey, as I said, on on the command of Jesus, as verse 35 makes clear. This made the storm harder to understand. They were crossing the lake in obedience to the command of Jesus, and yet they were in danger of being drowned. There is a more of, than a note of a reproach, isn't there, in their words? Teacher, don't you care if we drown? They were making the same mistake that many Christians in our generation make. They believed that the presence of Jesus with them would shield them from all the problems and the difficulties of life. Here were these disciples obediently following Jesus wherever he went. They were daily attending to his ministry. They were listening to his word. They were daily testifying to the world that whatever the scribes and Pharisees might say, they believed in Jesus, they loved Jesus, and were not ashamed to give up for all for his sake. Yet here they were in trouble, tossed up and down by the rough sea and in danger of being drowned. There's a very serious lesson for us here. There are those who present the gospel today, saying that if you come to Christ and give your life to Christ, then everything in the garden will be rosy and you'll have no more problems and no more difficulties. And you man who had who was very serious ill with cancer. And one of these people told him that he obviously didn't have enough faith or he wouldn't be ill. It's so dangerous and so contradictory to what the Bible teaches. Jesus said, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, saying that we would be persecuted, that we may be children of your Father in heaven. For God causes his Son to rise on the evil and on the good. He sends his rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Even though we love Jesus and trust Jesus, we are not to expect that everything will be smooth on the journey to heaven. We're not to count it strange if we have to endure sickness or losses or bereavements or disappointments in life's journey. Free pardon, full forgiveness, grace by the way and glory at the end, all this our Savior has promised if we trust in him, if we love him and serve him. But he has never promised that we will be protected from the storms of life. As we face the storms and difficulties of life, Jesus teaches us precious lessons which we would never learn otherwise. Through the storms of life, we learn how empty we are, and we learn our weaknesses. We learn to be completely dependent on him. Just as the disciples faced this particular storm and cried out to the Savior, so in the midst of the storms of life, we are driven to the throne of grace in prayer. We are forced to our knees, seeking the help and the strength of Jesus. The different problems and difficulties we face in life Discipline us, strengthen us, and equip us for heaven. (coughs) The Bishop J.C. Ryle, who at one time was the Bishop of Liverpool, wrote this. In the resurrection morning, we shall say, it is good for me that I was afflicted. We shall thank God for every storm. Our salvation does not exempt us from the storms of life. We all face problems and difficulties as we live day by day in this world. But Jesus promises to be with us and to lead us and to help us and to guide us through the storms. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Jesus is with us as we face the storms of life. And that really leads us to the second lesson in this passage, and that is the sovereign Jesus. In this instance, we see clearly the two sides of the person of Jesus, that he is both truly God and truly man. 
We see his humanity in verse 38. Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. The human Jesus knew all the same desires and all the needs, same needs as us. There were times when he was hungry. There were times when he was thirsty. There was times when he felt pain. And there were times like now when he was weary and needed rest. He had been up preaching to the crowds of people. He had been ministering all day that day. And so he takes the opportunity as the, as the boat crosses the lake to lay, put his head down and to sleep. This Jesus in whom we are called to trust came into this world as a human being. He came as a man. He knows all the trials of a human being for he experienced them while he was here on earth. He knows the susceptibilities of a human being. He understands clearly when we cry to him for help from all the pressures of life, for he faced them. It was necessary for Jesus to be a human being so that he could stand before God on our behalf and bear the judgment of our sin. The writer of the Hebrews puts it like this. He too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. Or writing to the Corinthians, sorry, to the Colossians, Paul put it like this, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. What does the Bible mean by these verses? They teach us that Jesus took upon himself the very human nature in which Adam succumbed to Satan's power. And Jesus, as a human being, gained the victory over Satan for Adam's race. Through Adam's sin, through Adam's sin entered into the world and human beings became fallen creatures with sinful natures. But Jesus came as the second Adam and through his perfect humanity and ultimate sacrifice on the cross, he won the victory over sin and Satan so that we might know his forgiveness and his salvation. But in this incident, we also see the reality of the divinity of Jesus. Here we see him as the Lord of nature. He got up. He rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. Jesus, the creator and sustainer of all things, the elements knew his voice and were quiet at once. The God who blew with, blew with an east wind and dried up the waters of the Red Sea before his people Israel now makes a path over the waves of Galilee for his disciples. Only who? He who had created the wind and waves in the first place would dare to address them with such authority. And the instant response of obedience reveals to us his deity as creator as well as redeemer. We need to grasp this vision of Jesus as fully God and fully human. He is the sovereign master of the universe which he created. And he is the one who came into this world as a human being that he might save us from our sin. Even though they traveled with him, even though they saw the miracles that he performed, the disciples were filled with fear as they faced this storm. And that really leads us to the third thing I want us to note. It's in verse 40, the searching questions. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you have, still have no faith? Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were frightened because of their lack of faith. When faith fails, fear flourishes. Fear paralyzes faith so that it cannot work. Are we like the disciples allowing worry or fear or anxiety to grip us? When confronted by the problems of life, do we worry about it? Do we allow fear to grip us? Or do we trust in Jesus? Jesus put the reaction of the disciples down 
to an inadequate faith. Fortunately, the disciples had nowhere else to turn, and so they came to Jesus. And when Jesus revealed himself as capable of handling, handling even the forces of nature, they were amazed. They cried to him as he was sleeping, and rising, he spoke authoritatively, and nature obeyed his voice. And verse 41 tells us that Jesus' miracle caused a different kind of fear. They were terrified and asked one another, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. The Greek word which the Bible uses to describe the fear of the storm, that they were frightened because of the storm, meant cowardly fear. But the word here used to describe the fear of Jesus that came into their heart, which the NIV translates as terrified, <clears throat> this word means reverence or filled with awe. The fear which the disciples had, the cowardly fear which they had of the storm, gave way to a fear of reverence of the Lord. They were awakened to the fact that a greater power than humans know was demonstrated before them. They were not able to grasp the reality that Jesus was in fact God. The lesson was learned and they stood in fear of the Lord, that fear which is the beginning of wisdom. It is that fear which drives out false fears. For a proper fear of the Lord, as we stand in awe of Jesus, that will eliminate the fear of the world. I read a story of two boys and one is saying to the other, go ahead and take the apples of the tree. Your father will not hurt you. But the other boy responded, I know. But if I disobey, I will hurt him. It is true faith when we fear not just being hurt, but hurting our heavenly father. This is a godly fear which arises out of faith. Here's a fear that says, I would rather perish in the storm with Jesus than be safe on land without him. The person who fears God need not fear anything else, for nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of God. This was an important lesson for the disciples in this, part, in this miracle. The picture closes with them asking the question which all must ask. What manner of man is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? And of course, his power demands that the answer be, he is the son of God. When we trust in Christ and allow his power to still the storms in us, there should be an overflowing benefit to all those around us. So let's ask ourselves this question. Is there anything our sovereign Lord Jesus cannot do? Is he not the creator and the sustainer of the universe? Is he not the one who loves us, who cares for us, who died for our sin on the cross? If we trust in him, he saves us from the terrible consequences of our sin. Will he not be with us and watch over us in all the problems and the anxieties? And the difficulties and the storms of life. Do not worry or be afraid when life throws storms our way, but trust in Jesus to see us through. We sang earlier the great old BB hymn, Will your anchor hold in the storms of life? When the clouds unfold their wings of strife, when the strong tides lift and the cables strain, will your anchor drift? or firm remain. We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll, fastened to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. Are you grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love? Let us pray.
Father, even the wind and the waves obey you and your son, Jesus. Have mercy on those whose lives are wrecked by storms and by floods and by cyclones and by earthquakes. We pray for all who have suffered hardship, sickness, bereavement, or job loss this year as a result of the pandemic. We pray for Christians who suffer discrimination and persecution as, they, uh, as the world faces these kind of events. We thank, O oh God, of Christians who are neglected when relief is distributed. Please provide for your faithful people who choose hunger and possibly death rather than deny you to receive food. Help us to learn from their wonderful example of perseverance and courage and love. We pray for all who are worried, nervous, timid, for those crippled by fear of any kind. We pray for those whose spirits are held in bondage by the fear of death or darkened by the dread of ill health or poverty. We pray for all who, in the face of temptation, distrust themselves but fail to put their trust in you. Father, we pray for the country of Afghanistan at this time of upheaval and transition unfolding amidst rising COVID-19 cases. We remember those evacuated or fleeing Afghanistan, that they will find refuge and be guided in their next steps. We pray for peace and stability in a country at this critical point in their history. We pray especially for Afghan believers for their protection, for their encouragement, for access to the Bible in their own language and courage in the face of ongoing persecution. We pray that the Holy Spirit will move across this land, bringing rivers of living water to the dry desert and cause many hearts to turn to the hope and life that is only found in the Lord Jesus. Finally, Father, we pray for all those who will return to school this week. Bless children as they return to school. Help them to discover and develop the gifts that you have given them. As they grow in knowledge, help them also to grow in kindness and compassion, learning to respect themselves and others. We pray especially for children starting new schools, those going into P1, those going into year 8, or changing school for other reasons. We thank you for teachers who have given their lives to serving our children. Bless them as they prepare for a new school year. Fill them with strength to lead, grace to guide, and hope to thrive in their classroom. Bless them as they serve our children and seek to influence them. We commit to you those who serve as classroom assistants and in other supporting roles. We thank you for the many Christians who serve in our schools as governors, teachers, principals, classroom assistants, support staff, and volunteers. We pray that they may use the opportunities presented to them to build God's kingdom in their different roles. We pray for those involved in management roles, especially those involved in pastoral care, that they would have great wisdom in handling often complex needs of children, young people, and their families. For we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.
to one another. The grace of our Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ, the love of God, and the, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, Spirit be, be with us all evermore. evermore. Amen. Amen.